Who is behind the decisions that affect the future of entire generations? How can we engage in dialogues with them? Do we need to listen to them for them to listen to us? Being young and trying to understand the corporate world can be tricky. But remember, the youth of today will become the CEOs of tomorrow. We aim to initiate conversations with decision makers amidst the ecological and climate crisis to build bridges towards future challenges. Join us on this journey as we unravel the complexities of the climate puzzle in order to find the missing pieces and build the sustainable future for generations to come. Welcome to the Climate Puzzle. Welcome to the Climate Puzzle, the podcast where we unravel the complexities of our changing climate and explore the role of influential leaders in shaping a sustainable present and future. Today, we have the honor of hosting two key players from the energy industry, Gerard Gallagher, EY EMEA Energy and Sustainability Industry Leader. EMEA means Europe, Middle East, India and Africa, uh, for those that are not familiar with the term. And Mickey Corcoran, Vice President Sustainability at SLB, a global technology company. So, uh, hi Mickey, first of all, thank you for you uh, being with us today. Please tell us what does SLB do? First of all, very nice to be here. Uh, a pleasure and certainly a pleasure for us in terms of getting ready for the run up to COP28, which we are all very excited about. So SLB, we are a technology company um, used to be known as Schlumberger, now SLB. Uh, and we were a very well-known technology company providing technologies and solutions for the oil and gas industry, uh, now providing technology for the energy industry. So that's in short, and I know I'm going to talk a lot more about it during this session, but in short, that's, that's who we are. Okay. Uh, and Gerard, what's your role in the energy industry? Please tell us. Well, I believe it or not, I work for um, an organisation like EY, but I'm a geophysicist by background, Maximo. I'm an engineer, so I started off my uh, career uh, very much at the, the working side of the energy world. Uh, it's a few years ago now, Maximo, though, before you ask. But I, but I am from that background. And now I progressed uh, and I work at an organisation called EY, Ernst & Young, which is one of the largest international professional services firms around the world and I've got the luckiest job in the world right now. I have the benefit of being able to corral all of EY's resources from around the world to support our clients, get through the haze and the fog associated with the energy transition to try and support them find a way to make an impact in their own business but also in society as a whole. So my job essentially is to, to bring the best of EY to support our clients uh, in a way that they can make the biggest impact. So that's my role. <laughs> what a role, no? <laughs> very, both very challenging in this adventure of the energy transition. Um, before we dive into the climate related aspects, we will let you get you know on a more personal level. Can you share a story from your childhood that has influenced your perspective on the world? Let's start first with Mickey. Yeah, interesting question. Um, so first of all, I, I, I'm from the UK and I grew up in Wales in a very small town called Llandudno. So I'll test you later, Maximo, if you can say it, the Llandudno. <laughs> and a uh, small town, going to a small high school, Um, and I think I always felt in a way that there was something more that I wanted to do. I wanted to go to a bigger place. I wanted to do bigger things. And, uh, I think that's always been behind me and excelling me to move forward and all the decisions I've made in my life of which university to go to the furthest away from home, which company to go for the one that will take me the furthest away also, uh, from my home. Um, and this is how I ended up actually in SLB. And I think that's also been behind me also when I've been, uh, progressing, uh, through, through my career. And, you know, one of the things I think from my childhood that really helped and the reason why I'm telling you this now is because I think if everybody 
think a little bit like this, I think it would make the energy transition a lot easier um, and a lot faster, is that my parents always challenged me. You know, my dad used to say to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And my mom was an, an accountant at the time. But for me, as a little girl, I thought she worked in a store because every time I went in there, she was always doing something in the shop. Right. But she was an accountant for the shop. And so I said, I want to work in a shop like my mom and my dad always used to say, well, you know, you, you can do better than that. You can do more than that. Think about outside of the box. Think about other things that you could potentially do. And I think as I went also through my life, I always had this advice from my parents of think again. Really? Is that really what you want to do? Do you want to do this? Or think how to do that. Have you thought about how to do that yourself? Have you reached out to the right organizations to help you do what you want to do? So I think if everybody has this different mindset and growth mindset, I think it can be applied to a lot. It can be applied for individuals. It can be applied to companies in terms of thinking about how they're going to position themselves now within the transition and after the transition, right? Because this is how we're going to be able to, to thrive. So I'll leave it with that. But uh, that's my uh, little contribution. Very interesting, Miggy. Sometimes we wonder what if we don't only ask what do you want to do when you are, uh, o sea, the typical question, no? Yeah. What do you want to do yeah. when you grow up? What yeah. if we ask as a collective, where yeah. do we want to be as a country or as a state yes. or as a small community. Yes. Exactly. If we ask that exactly. when we are kids, maybe we'll be yeah. uh, in a better place also. Yeah. And how about you, Gerard? Well, I, I grew up in, a, in a, the youngest of a very, very large family. So I think I've got at least still alive 45 cousins. So it was never, never very um, private around my home. I, my mum and dad were from... My mother's from Scotland, my father was from Ireland. I was the first of those cousins to go to university, believe it or not. So I felt so privileged and responsible. My father was um, the son of a farmer who was the son of a farmer who was the son of a farmer. So I was very connected. Every time I wasn't um, studying or working, I was very much put to work on the farm. And one of the things that that really taught me was two things. One is... It is so fragile, the connection between humanity and nature. If any of those things go out of, um, out of cycle, some really challenging things can happen. And there's a lot of history from where my family came from in Ireland of that happening and causing a lot of challenges. And two, personal responsibility. A bit like what Mickey was saying, actually. We've got to own this agenda. And it's very easy to think, I'm going to leave it for someone in the next generation or the next generation or the next generation. One of the things that my family taught is that you really want to leave your legacy in a better place for the next generation than you found it. And that's why you've got two passionate people in Mickey and I, because it's not easy, but we are very committed to trying to, to set things up so that the next generation can take it forward in a different way. So that's my couple of lessons. The balance between nature and humanity and personal responsibility to leave it in a better place. You know, I just, I just learned something, by the way, you know, Gerard. I am also, so my sister and I were also the only kids from our family to go to university as well, out of... Wow. Many cousins, mm, I'm quite yeah. a large. Experience. And you and I are not that old, Mickey. We're not right? that so old, not but I, I here, think but... I, I think we're not that yeah. old. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for sure, that's that was definitely a thing. So, why why we ask these personal questions? Because if not, it's like if you are not human beings, you are a role or a position in a company or in the private world or in the public sector, and for us, it's very important to understand that. We are uh, uh, sisters, brothers, uh, fathers. We we are a, a human being that we have all the same problems that everyone. Um, and if we go directly to the chase, it's like if we're from totally different planets. And we, we need to we need to start having empathy with the the backstage of each person. No, like Gerard was saying, he. 
he's the youngest, he's the first one who got to to this to has these incredible opportunities, and it's important for us. Um, but apart from that, now yes, we go directly to the <laughs> energy <laughs> world. Um, let's start with Gerard. Sure. Um, how are different countries and industries handling this transition, this huge, this uh, massive transition that we need to do in such a short time? And what are the major forces you think that uh, drives us towards a green energy future? Well, Maximo, and Mickey will cover some of these points that I draw out, but from the, the overall picture, the one thing that I have to say there is so there is no one single energy transition pathway. Every country, every organization has its own bespoke journey on this energy pathway. This is really complex. So let me give you some f reasons why that is. First of all, we are starting from a point of inequality. The global north is more equipped than the global south to manage its way through this energy transition pathway and as as a result there's a variation in the speed at which the world is moving so no single pathway inequalities from the starting point and a variety of speed for example europe the us uk japan probably leading forces in the energy transition they have the money they have the capital and they have the supply chain to move fast enough if you look at where the slower transition is happening is in countries like Africa. Maximo, Africa holds 60% of the world's capacity for solar power, but it only has 1% of the solar power capacity installed on the continent of Africa. That is a huge imbalance for the energy transition. A couple of the key drivers of change, and, and I'm hoping Mickey will pick a few of these up, there is no doubt technology is one of the key drivers of change. The affordability of clean energy is really coming to a tipping point. For example, the cost of solar power now, Maximo, installed, is the cheapest form of energy generation in the world. Solar power is now the newest and the cheapest form of energy installed anywhere in the world. So as you move forward, if you want cheaper energy, you need to be thinking about solar. We also think about energy storage. That's another area that's being really innovated and coming to an economic tipping point. The reason why that's important, of course, the sun doesn't always shine at night uh, and we have to store that energy that's being created during the day. So the, the solar PV panels and the storage systems have to go hand in hand to actually create a functioning energy system. A couple of other things. This will be interesting to, to hopefully some of the listeners today. The consumer behaviour is changing. Uh, for the first time, uh, millennials and Gen Zs are the majority of the citizens on this planet. They're not committed to continuing with the status quo. So where there's a consumer change, there is an opportunity to drive for the disruption. And then finally, I would say geopolitics is a big force. Energy security, the recent war or the current war that's happening in Ukraine woke up the entire world, particularly those who are net importers of energy from abroad. And this year, sorry, last year, Maximo, the world spent $1 trillion in accelerating renewable technology. And that has the potential to reduce the energy transition in the global north by 10 years. So energy security is becoming a big issue. So those are the kind of factors that are at play when you think about the energy transition. But there's no single pathway and it's complex. Uh, that's, that's interesting. The, there's no one single pathway. We usually talk about pluralism. We are so different from different backgrounds, so much diversity. And uh, there's not only one solution, so thank you for that, Gerard. And Miki, um, you are all about innovation, no? So please let us know how are you using these innovations to reduce the 
carbon footprint of oil and gas companies, especially that they are all always under the how do you say the the thing this in English the loop under uh, magnifying the glass. magnifying under glass. the magnifying glass under yes. the magnifying glass so <laughs> exactly uh, exactly tell us a little bit about the challenges and and uh, well yeah so there's a lot to unpack right and I think uh, Gerard set the stage uh, very nicely and actually I'll I'll use a couple of examples uh, in what I talk about today uh, from the the topics that Gerard put on the table now but just to step back a little bit is I think the energy industry today is facing one of its biggest challenges of all time, right? And, you know, Gerard said it very well. Affordable, sustainable energy is what we all need to be uh, looking towards. And there's one thing that is for certain is that the energy mix of today will not be the same as the energy mix of tomorrow. And so today, the energy mix is largely oil and gas. And the renewables energy capacity is growing much faster than we thought it ever could, right? But has a long way to go. So for us as a technology company, it is extremely important that we continue our place in providing technologies that can build a cleaner oil and gas future so that even though the energy mix will be quite reliant on oil and gas in the next couple of decades, but at the same time, repositioning ourselves as well to be the company that can scale uh, and bring affordable technology to the picture, right? And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. But, you know, if you think about, I think there's two real agendas for companies in the energy industry today. One is to look at our own footprint and what we do and what we contribute to oil and gas emissions of today. Right? And then secondly, is to look at what we can do to help others to decarbonize and other companies to decarbonize. And in a way, this is the, the beauty of uh, Gerard and I, two very passionate people, but also two people that work for companies who are trying to do the same thing but are complementary to each other. You know, we have the technology uh, to bring solutions forward to help to, to, to scale and accelerate uh, some of the solutions and technologies we need. And then EY have their specific expertise to also help to accelerate. So this is the beauty of building these kinds of partnerships to try to enable uh, the transition uh, to help uh, much faster. So I wanted to give a couple of examples so that you can have a feel for what many companies are doing today when they're looking at their own footprint. The first thing we do is we look at our own scope one and two, right? So SLB has scope one and two commitments. So we have committed to be 50% um, less scope one and two by uh, 2030 and net zero by 2050. And we've also committed to scope three, 30% reduction by 2030. So when we look at our own scope one and two, really a lot of it is the electricity that uh, powers our facilities and it's the fuel that we use in the field. And so for us, we've had the last three years since we built our greenhouse gas inventory to look at how specifically we're going to reduce our own emissions. Because, you know, if we understand that, we can also help our customers to do the same thing. And today, just after three years later, we've actually reduced our scope two by more than 50% in our facilities. And that's coming from taking the opportunity to, to reach all of the renewable energy capacity that we can get today. And, you, you know, you might say, OK, well, so what? Anybody can switch their contracts to renewable energies. And yes, that's what we have done quite, quite aggressively. But at the same time, we are creating demand. We're creating demand for that renewable energy, which allows those companies to continue to invest in renewable energy, which will in turn make it uh, scalable and, and more affordable. So we believe that we are we are part of the part of the future in that. And then in terms of fuels, I mean, there's lots of projects ongoing right now in terms of efficiency and also uh, potentially looking at biofuels uh, in replacement for fuels. And then, of course, electrification uh, is a big topic. But those are the, the, the subjects that we're looking at uh, today. 
Um, and then, you know, of course, decarbonizing oil and gas, there's a plethora of technologies that we have called our transition technologies that help our customers to pick lower carbon solution technologies. So one example I will give is low carbon cement, uh, which is uh, a different formulation of cement that is lower carbon that is on the table today for our customers uh, to choose. And there are many other examples, but these are just some of the elements of what we're doing in the in the market today uh, to help our customers to be able to decarbonize for the future. So imagine that you're talking to people that just don't know any, anything about the energy transition. Uh, they just know that we need to reduce the carbon footprint by, by now, by 2030, tomorrow. So big question for both. We have right now the technology If you could choose, if you are the, I don't know, the president of the world <laughs> and you can push a button, we have right now the technology to do this transition. And can we keep our current levels of energy consumption by relying solely on renewable energies? Um, not only in energy levels, because, ah, okay, your uh, <laughs> answer. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot, right? We cannot. And, um, you know, when we look at, okay, I will give you a few numbers. I'll throw a few numbers out there. That is uh, numbers that I talk about a lot uh, internally and externally is that when you look at the emissions from the energy industry today, um, the, the, there is emissions are five gigatons of CO2 today. And half of those gigatons, so 2.4 uh, gigatons, is actually coming from methane emissions. So you can do whatever you want with renewable energy to help to decarbonize the other parts of the operations for oil and gas, whether it's upstream or downstream, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the methane emissions uh, that also counts. And methane emissions, they come from flaring operations, they come from uh, venting, from uh, leaking uh, infrastructure, etc. So you know, the the easiest solution would be, say, okay, just stop flaring and then figure out where you're venting and then let's seal those uh, those leaks. The challenge we have today is that, you know, the technology today, it exists to be able to monitor this, to be able to uh, identify areas where potentially uh, are high priority because of the amount of uh, CO2 and methane being released. The challenge is, is it a priority? Yes or no? Is there regulation in place that will drive action towards this? And I have to say, I have been personally really impressed at the way that COP28 have been positioning themselves with the Energy Transition Group in terms of driving um, industry to further their commitments to lower methane. So this is something that is, I think, is really important because it not only accelerates the commitments of these companies, but it also helps to drive regulation and policy that is going to be required to make it a priority of these companies to change the way that they are doing things today. So and in a way, it will also help us to develop the technologies further to make it to diagnose where is where are your uh, methane emissions and then act upon them to be able to reduce them but i think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there uh, that needs action today and i'm really hopeful that um, after cop 28 that there will be a significant amount of more action uh, towards doing this in the future yeah yeah the methane world it's something that is not it doesn't have much marketing as the the the, the carbon world, no? Um, oh, yeah. yes, uh, and Gerard, what do you think about this? Well, you know, it begins with the back to this complex energy transition pathway, Maximo, that there is no real substitute for our current reliance on oil and gas, certainly for in the near term, for most parts of the world. So what Mickey is saying is rather than just waiting for renewables to scale up and then make this cold transition, there is so much we can do today, now, 
to reduce the impact on our climate with energy being generated from oil and gas. But let me give you some things that I think could be things that we could all do today. Remember my little bit at the start about personal responsibility, Maxima? It begins here. So let me talk about consumers. In the global north, particularly even during COVID, our governments subsidised the real cost of energy so we can continue to use energy abundantly at a lower cost. So we have become conditioned in some parts of the world to have limitless amount of energy at a low cost. This cannot continue. With the level of investments going into renewables, and as I mentioned some numbers earlier, one trillion dollars last year. This is not the real cost of energy we're feeling. So our consumers, we need to consume less. We need to be really thoughtful. And I think technology is a big role to play to educate us. I don't know how many people on there who will be listening to this podcast have a smart meter or some kind of tracking mechanism installed in their home to really understand what energy they're using. There are very many apps out there at the moment supported by AI technology that will tell you this is a really good time to charge your laptop, maybe even charge your mobile phone because the grid is going green. Let's utilise some of the energy that's coming in now rather than waiting to when you want to do it. But we did a survey just to give you a little bit of hope here, Maximo. And I remember I talked about Gen Z millennials becoming the majority of the citizens on the planet. We did a survey, I don't think I've shared this with you yet, Mickey, but we did a survey of 70,000 consumers across 18 geographies. Over half of them told us that they will no longer buy a car that has an internal combustion engine this time. How many? The next time they buy a car. Over half of them. So over half said that they will buy an electric vehicle or no vehicle at all. And over half of them also said that they will be installing solar battery storage system or air source heat pump systems if it's affordable to them in their home. So I can tell you the way to change an industry is for consumers to start thinking about different ways. So that's one thing. But it's not easy because the transition is complex. The, the infrastructure that costs to get renewables online, to get it up to speed, is really expensive to connect each other's homes into this new way of generation. And like I say, decarbonising, as Mickey said, of the oil and gas sector is super important. All of this has to happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Maximo, do you know how much talent we need and how much technology we need to commit to this agenda? So this is where personal responsibility comes in. Reduce your demand, reuse, and really think about recycling whatever you're doing with energy. Be smart about what you require. And we will need all industries, including the oil and gas industry, to really commit to reducing their footprint because we need them while to make this transition. So yeah. I would like to add yeah, a maybe. little bit to this, if you don't mind, Maximo, because um, it's a point that I've been dying to make since uh, Gerard spoke earlier about the solar panels, right? And everything that Gerard just said now is so important. And one of the main elements of why it's so important is that Yes, solar panel, our energy coming from solar today is cheaper than uh, fossil fuels. And yes, it has taken 20 years to get there. But why is it taken 20 years? And why is it cheaper today? Well, number one is that it's taken 20 years because there was no demand. Because it was expensive and people didn't see the value and the technology wasn't great. So investment versus return wasn't great for the consumer. Now the technology has developed to a point where it's cheaper for the consumer, it's more efficient, which means that it's worth the consumer investing in it in terms of the energy that they get back. And so if you think about this and you think about what Gerard just said, if 50% of people are thinking about having zero vehicles or at least having the, the, the electric vehicle, it means there's a demand out there 
for companies developing electric uh, vehicles and the technology associated with it to have the demand required to be able to scale it and make it more affordable. And the same applies for all the technologies that we need to invest in and develop for the transition. And so the sooner that we can get this demand and the sooner that we can get this scalability, the better it will be and the faster that we can go, right? And that and the, solar, um, the solar panel example is such a good one because I think every, Everybody can relate to that. Yes, yes. The supply and demand mechanisms are not only for solar panels, but for organic food, for for everything. What we realize is that the energy agenda is not as big for the, the consumer than, for example, the organic uh, fruit. You know, uh, it's like that it's more far away what is going on with the energy. So we had to do a huge, a huge work of awareness and education about uh, the individual actions that we can do every day. And thank you that you brought this about the, the ordinary citizen, what we can do. As something else that you can recommend to, because if not, we are always waiting for the government to do something about the energy, to do new laws or whatever. But uh, what else can we do as individuals? We can buy more solar panels, so we tell the market, hey, we have a demand. What else? Deficiency. We can go and, okay, don't leave the lights on. What else can we do? We can to push this agenda, like social media, like putting the word out there. What we can do? So maybe I'll give you, uh, for me, you know, I, I've got, you know, children who I continually talk to them about about this and they give me some ideas and so for me first of all everyone needs to adapt to the circumstances in which they're in maximo this is a, a really specific energy transition that helps individuals it hits individuals in different ways so if you're in a rural village somewhere in sub-saharan africa or in some parts of other rest of the world your your transition is very different to someone who has access to renewable energy so it needs to be you need to tailor actions for personal circumstances Reduce your consumption, and that's not just the energy, but in general, reduce your consumption. Reuse what you can rather than buying and acquiring more, and recycle, which minimizes energy and waste. Make a choice. Support organizations that are you know, moving towards sustainable services. Really ask those questions about what are their credentials. With the incoming regulation, and, and Mickey touched on this, I have really high hopes that the level of transparency and trust that you will find in public domain within two to three years will give people the confidence that organisations are making changes. The greenwashing concept will be around, but it will be a lot, lot less because the regulation and the need for the level of scrutiny, and I can tell you that because our organisations provide that scrutiny, is going up. So make choices based on that information and then be an advocate. Do what you're doing, Maximo. Be an advocate. Help educate people. That's the four things that I think, but really reduce, reuse, recycle and make choices. The three R's. That's probably from my... my uh, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not complicated. Yeah, I think it's, it's beautiful what you say, Gerard. I think you covered all the points. I think one thing I'll add to that is that I've actually been really impressed, by the way, you know, Gerard and I, we also have kids that are similar age, right? So it's kind of spooky, but I've actually been very impressed at the way the schools are teaching the children today on sustainability topics, right? And uh, I think we've come a, a long, long way in terms of that. I think the other thing we can do, and Gerard mentioned emerging economies, right, and having a just transition, One of the things that we've been involved in for many, many years now is uh, we have what we call is our seed program, where we've always been, um, uh, say, we've always valued STEM education and making sure that any community where we live and work have the ability to have their, their children, the population, be able to have an opportunity in STEM education. And we've recently expanded that into covering topics of climate action and water. And so we work together with universities to develop the content and then we provide the content to schools. Sometimes we provide the content or teach the content and then we also teach the train the trainers and teach the teachers to deliver the content. 
And I think this has a massive impact, right, especially on smaller communities where they really need help to try to understand these topics. And I think it's a way that we will be able to help accelerate some of these communities uh, in taking uh, the right action as well. Yeah, Mickey, there's no doubt all the all the research that we are showing about the resources and skills that we need globally to make this energy transition just and move at the right pace is vast. This is a time when we need people to step up and learn their, their science, technology, engineering, maths. We need people to be engineers. We need people to be curious. And you know, some of those biggest emitting sectors, Maximo, if we get them right and get them moving quicker, we actually could move a lot faster. So rather than turning, I certainly look at uh, the strategy from, from my organization. I look at the biggest emitters in the world and I think, what can I do to help them? That's what, where the world really needs our help. Uh, starting at the, at the worst case scenario as soon as possible. We need a lot of young talent to come in and support us in that. Will empower that phrase. We need a lot of youth involved. Um, it's 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 a responsibility of every generation, but the new generations are in, inheriting the the situation. So we need them to be on board a hundred percent, and we will work very hard for that to happen. Um, so we are we are running out of time. Uh, a final message. Uh, we we got a lot to think about what we just discussed. Uh, of course, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes is never enough for these this kind of topics. We need hundreds of hours of conversation and action more than talk. We need to act. Um, a final a final reflection, a final message for the audience. Who goes first? Mickey. Uh, I I can go. Yeah. So my final message is for everyone to realize that this is not going to be um, an easy journey, but it is absolutely possible. I think we have um, a lot of expertise in the world. We have the investment somewhere. This is about innovation, and it's about really thinking about What is the challenge of tomorrow? What do we need to invest in today to make that happen? And being very bold and stepping up and really investing time to innovate and find those solutions and make them affordable um, and scalable to the point where we can meet our climate goals. Mickey, I, I, I think building on that, for, for me, you know, Maximo, it's really, really important that we have an inclusive energy transition that takes into consideration that everyone has a different starting point and everyone has a different end point. It's really important we engage with communities, engage with everyone to understand what their pathway is because without that, we're not going to bring the world together to solve this in the right way. So my, my, my kind of hope is by educating as many people as we can on the complexity of this, trying to understand what needs to be true for their community and for their influence to move forward. We need the talent to come into the, our industries like Mickey's organization and mine and many others to support us and roll our sleeves up because we're in a hurry and we have the technology to do that. And I truly believe right now more than ever, I have an optimism bias about the momentum that's building. And I really think if we could really lean in we can move on and, and really change the agenda really, really quickly. I was super, super pleased about the product, the, the level of activity that happened during COVID and the investments is moving the energy transition on really fast in some of those countries. But we've got more to do, Maximo. So keep up the good work, my friend. Okay, well, Gerard, Mickey, thank you very much for being here. Um, optimism is the final word. Optimism. <laughs> Let's let's hope and optimism. Um, when I was young, my mother used to tell me, "When you pray, move your feet." So, hope, optimism, and action. Uh, and everyone that is listening, thank you for joining us. Together, we can piece together the puzzle of climate change and build a greener, better, resilient world. 
We look forward to continuing this journey with you in future episodes of the Climate Puzzle. Bye bye, big hug. See you there. Was it easy to decode this suit? Our challenge is to build bridges with all the social actors whose decisions have a huge impact and try to create a more sustainable present and future. The only way to save our planet is by working together. Did you solve the puzzle?